And I just point that out because here was one of the leading philanthropists in the town. And it didn't bother him a bit because he was old at the time. He lived uh, to be 90 or yeah, almost 91. And uh, you know, it, he just accepted that as part of life. Uh, succeeding generations didn't and fortunately work to change things and things have now changed a great deal in the city. Uh, and I personally, I, I talk to the diversity center group every year and give a speech about what times were like back then and how they've changed and all about diversity. Uh, so let's go back a minute now to, uh, I think I've told you mostly about Nathan Dalby. And I said he had two sons. Uh, one of them, uh, his youngest son, Lincoln, lived in Akron. And Lincoln ended up with the May Company being a vice president, et cetera, of the chain and spent his career there. Uh, the oldest son was my father. My father grew up in Bratnall, where the family had a compound, one of those extended family compounds, uh, where there was a large straight house which was divided in two, it was really two homes, and then two homes behind it. So all of the family lived in that area. Uh, aunts, uncles, etc. in those days. Uh, and actually, one relative lived there until the 1970s or 80s, and I used to spend every Thanksgiving out there. Uh, so my father grew, grew up out there. Uh, he attended college, but did not graduate from Yale. He came back here, and he end, and in 1924, he, he was in the real estate business for a while, and then in 1924, he married Lucille Dobby, Nathan Dobby's daughter. And then he went and spent 18 years with the May Company, ended up as a store manager, uh, a store operating manager of Mays downtown. Uh, he left in 1943 to go into the Army. That was a story in itself because being 42 years old at the time, he was pretty old to go in the Army, but he wanted to go in. He spent about six months trying to get in, uh, trying to get some kind of a commission and all that, and he ended up being a captain in the uh, PX department and spent most of the war running a PX down in Texas uh, for the Army. Uh, when he came back, he did not go back into the May Company. Uh, he had a steel fabricating business and he was in a number of things. But he spent a great deal of his time philanthropically. He was on all kinds of boards in the city, all kinds of organizations uh, that he worked with, some of which he chaired. And uh, I have all kinds of files of many, many organizations that he was part of in this city. Uh, the other, another very significant thing he did he and a group of men in 1936 decided to bring professional football to Cleveland. Uh, why? Because it would be a good thing for the city. I mean, there was no money in it at the time. Uh, in fact, I can tell you in those early days that they used to all meet, at the, he used to host a lunch every Monday 
complained of, of these dozen men. And they would all come down and somebody would say, well, here's what we owe to players, here's what we owe to coach, here's what we owe the laundry bill, here's what we owe. They'd add it up on a napkin while they were having lunch, and then everybody, they'd divide it by the number of people and everybody would chip in the money, and that's how they paid the bills for the week. That was in 1936. In 1937, they joined the NFL, and things were the same. I mean, it wasn't, it was a little better than the league they were in the year before. But it, it was just a labor of love in those days. And that's why it was done. Uh, when he went in the army, he sold his interest, as did others, to two people who won a championship, actually, in 1945, and then moved the team to Los Angeles. In the meantime, however, part of the reason they moved to Los Angeles is because another league was starting, and there was a Cleveland presence in the other league. Uh, the principal person was Mickey McBride, who owned the cab company. And my father was asked if he wanted to be a part of it. So he did. He invested in the start of the Cleveland Browns in 1946. Uh, and we had an interest in the Cleveland Browns as a family from 1946 to 1995 when the team announced it was moving and I sold our interest in a four-day period because I would be, I said I would be no part of moving the Browns out of Cleveland. But my father started that and he was involved and each time when Mickey McBride sold and a new group bought and then another group bought and then finally in 60, 1961 uh, when Modell's group bought, he always sold and bought in with the new group. So he retained his interest all those times. Uh, and it was never for money. In fact, the first time they really started to make any money was in the 60s. Uh, he died in 1966, so he saw just the beginning of the change in professional football. But he was a very significant part of uh, bringing professional football to Cleveland and sustaining it through the years. When he died, I took over the family's interest and guided it from that point on. <clears throat> so that was my father's life. And my mother, uh, she did not work. She was a homebody. She kept the house uh, and brought up four children, which was work. Uh, and she was very involved in philanthropy, too, uh, in many organizations in the city. And that gets down to, I was one of four siblings. Uh, two of them left Cleveland after high school and never came back. Uh, and one, my sister Ellen, uh, spent part of her uh, adult life in Cleveland, but then moved to Aspen for the last 20 years of her life. Uh, before she died some years ago. Uh, I was married uh, to a gal from Atlanta, Georgia, and had three children. And uh, then we were divorced after 15 years. And then I married Sally. And we have been, we just celebrated our 40th anniversary. Uh, and we have led a, what I think is a wonderful life. I mean, how lucky can you be 
uh, we have three children, two of whom live here in Cleveland, and also a nephew uh, who was my sister's child who moved in with us when she went to Aspen and we really brought him up from high school on and considered him as one of our sons also. So here we have four children, three living in Cleveland, seven grandchildren, six of whom live within a mile and a half of our house. And I've had the same house for 53 years now. I don't move around. Uh, and so they're all here right near and we've been able to watch them all grow up. The oldest one, oldest grandchild, just went to college this year. Uh, and they're all fairly close in age. They range from like 18 to, to uh, 12, all seven of them. So uh, I'm a very lucky guy. Uh, my wife and I have devoted our lives uh, to philanthropy, although we worked also. I worked for 12 years uh, at the May Company when I was out of college. Ended up being general manager of the Mays on the Heights store uh, out in University Heights. <coughs> and after that 12 years, I left the retail business and I spent 30 years in the venture capital business. But my real love has always been Cleveland and the philanthropic life of Cleveland. I've served on dozens and dozens of uh, organizations. I think I'm still on 14 boards or something. But I've been on the boards of probably 30 or 40 of the Cleveland organizations. We uh, try to give to, I think we give annually to over 40 Cleveland organizations uh, in significant amounts. And uh, had a wonderful time doing it. Uh, I take no credit for, uh, because I, I think I was not only destined, but sort of selected by my parents to try to carry on the family traditions, uh, which, as you can see, are some awfully big footsteps. And you can't match, I never tried, can't match people like Rabbi Grease and Nathan Dobby. But uh, I think uh, along with the great help of Sally, uh, tried to carry on the traditions and, and also make some impact on Cleveland in a number of ways. Uh, so let's see, where do I University go from here? I have, I, I, I mentioned I have children living in Cleveland, uh, all but my son Bob, he lives in Tampa, Florida, where he's a very successful businessman. Uh, my daughter Peggy uh, and son Donald both live here, and of course uh, David, I consider my son, also lives here. Uh, Yes. Obviously, education. Yeah. Obviously, university circle for a long time. Obviously, well. <coughs> Let me tell you a little story about that because we, we, we look at philanthropy uh, maybe different from some people do. Of course, in the Jewish religion, you're brought up in that. Uh, you know, it's the old saying, if I'm not for myself, who will be? But if I'm only for myself, what am I? And that was one of the great Jewish prophets. And you're taught that from the beginning. But of course, I was taught by my parents and grandparents about philanthropy. So uh, it was just ingrained in us from the beginning. But we think of it perhaps differently from some people, and I'll tell you, tell you a little story about that. Oh, 15 to 
20 years ago, Sally had a major birthday. And I was trying to figure out what do I do for her birthday. Now a lot of people would have gone out and bought some beautiful piece of jewelry or a vacation to some exotic place in the world. Not that she's been deprived of either of those things. But that wasn't what I wanted. And my criteria at the time was it had to be something that was beautiful, because she loves beauty. It had to be something that would get better as it went along, just as Sally does. And thirdly, it had to be lasting. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what to do. And I finally came up with the idea. And I surprised her on her birthday by buying her the or endowing the entrance gardens at the Holden Arboretum. I knew she liked to go out there and walk the paths and enjoy the beauty of the place. And so I felt that would be something she'd really like. Well, I'll tell you what it led to. Two years later, I think it was two years later, she was invited to be on the board of the Holden. And a few years after that, she was chairman of the board, chairperson of the board, and chaired it for, I think, five years during a significant change in the institution. And now, 15, 20 years later, she is still, I think she's still serving on the board, and she's still out there all the time and still loves the place. So it was a First Jewish money? Pardon? First Jewish money there? <sighs> Could be. Could be. I'm trying to think. I don't want to say absolutely because I'm not positive that somebody couldn't have given them something before, but I think uh, first in any major way. Uh, but that was, that was my gift to her. And I don't think there's anything she would have ever liked better. But that wasn't the end of the story. She came back a few years later and surprised me on my birthday. Because, as you may know, I do adventure, endurance adventure trips all over the world on all continents, running, biking, hiking, mountain climbing. And so she surprised, surprises me by endowing a forum at the City Club on the subject of inspiration in my name. And that forum has brought here people like Ted Turner, people like Jim Tomey, who will be in the Baseball Hall of Fame if he ever retires and waits five years, you have to wait. <laughs> but he's a sure thing for that. Uh, people like Kyle Maynard, who was born without normal arms and legs and became a great wrestler. And I had the privilege of taking around Cleveland and taking him over to St. Ed's to meet and wrestle with the wrestling team over there. Uh, so she gave me that. And there's a third part of the story, because on my 70th birthday, which was 13 years ago, my children gave me a present, which is very dear to me. Uh, they endowed the speaker at the annual meeting of the Cleveland Foundation. Why? Because I had been on the distribution committee back 1972 to 1982. I'd worked with the foundation on many other things. Sally is now a member of the distribution committee of the, of the foundation, Cleveland Foundation. Uh, and so they endowed this. And every year, 
a speaker, and they've been great speakers, talks to six, seven hundred people or however many come to that annual meeting, it's a big crowd, who are the key players in philanthropy around the city or in the philanthropic institutions of the city? I can't think of anything they could have given me that would mean more to me. So we have used philanthropy maybe a little differently uh, than uh, some other people think of it. Not just writing checks, but... Let's talk yeah. about talking in university circles. Okay. Because you have had a presence at the Cleveland Music School Settlement. My parents. Cleveland Music School Settlement was one of my parents' uh, uh, philanthropies. And they gave a major room there, uh, in, yeah, building actually, in the name of my parents. Uh, that was the <clears throat> that was there actually in University Circle. We've been involved with many many organizations. Uh, the Hearing and Speech Center was one that was founded. Uh, or I shouldn't say founder, but the principal supporter in the early days of the Hearing and Speech Center was Nathan Dobby. And then he gave his house, his home on Euclid Avenue, to them for use as their headquarters when he moved out to uh, Oakwood Drive. And uh, my, he served on their board, my mother served on their board, uh, I ran their campaign in 1960 to build a new building when that house was no longer viable. Uh, and then uh, was just a uh, honorary chair of their recent campaign where they raised the money to move up to Euclid and 17th in their brand new headquarters. So we've been involved with that for a long, long time. Uh, my father was a major uh, contributor of prints and artwork and things to the art museum. Uh, I'm an honorary trustee of the Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, I've been involved with the Botanical Garden for probably 20-some years. Uh, head of their investment committee and involved in a number of other things with the garden great institution, was a gar called the Garden Center. Now it's Botanical Garden is taking on a whole new life with its green core uh, that it's, and the things it's moving into right now. Uh, Western Reserve Historical Society, uh, along with Al Ratner, the Ratner family and the Grease family in the 70s, started the Jewish Archives, and we funded that for a number of years uh, with Al's family until the Federation took it over. And just last year, and this is after 30 some years, uh, we were a significant part of the major funding uh, that now has endowed an archivist on a permanent basis uh, for the archives uh, at the Western Reserve Historical Society. Uh, Sally has been a board member of CASE for over 20 years. I think her term ends soon, but she's been a major person, was on the executive committee, uh, was involved in bringing Barbara Snyder here and introducing her to people all over Cleveland when she came, has been very involved in CASE for over 20 years. Uh, university hospitals, uh, I, I think I'm now, I think I'll, I'll probably be booted off soon, but I think I'm now the longest serving trustee at the present time at least. I don't know about some past history. But I've been on their board for 35 years, and I know I'm 
the longest serving of anybody on the board now. Uh, I was born in that hospital, incidentally, so I've got a long history with it. And, uh, but that's a major thing, and, and Sally and I have uh, endowed in my parents' name, because they both died of cancer and were treated at the hospital, uh, a center for uh, the discovery of new drugs, which we hope will produce some fine things in the field of cancer. Uh, and then, of course, there's the building we're sitting in now, uh, and that's Hawkins School, which is very dear to our hearts. I went to Hawkins School. Uh, son Bob went all the way through Hawkins School. Uh, David went there, his wife Jamie went there. Uh, five of our seven grandchildren are g going through Hawken now, uh, plus three nieces and nephews. Uh, so we're very much involved. But Sally, who of course never went to Hawken, uh, Sally has been on their board and after 20 years on their board was made a life member of their board. So I give her a lot of the credit for this because she was at the board meeting when the idea of University Circle was, uh, was suggested, uh, having a home here. And it was studied and then adopted. Uh, and she was involved in all of those discussions that took place and all that and then when they decided to go ahead, uh, they asked us for a lead gift, and that's when I got into the picture. I didn't, you know, she did all the heavy lifting uh, prior to that with the board and all that in coming up with the idea of a campus here and all that, and it's worked out wonderfully. The school is delighted with it. The teachers are ecstatic about what the kids are learning, uh, and we, couldn't be more pleased with, you know, having had the opportunity to step forward with that gift. Uh, so what more can I Anything else? You've really covered a lot. You. And it resonates with um, what we have gathered from people we've talked to. Uh, and resonates, I mean, I hope we have time to go to lunch because my family resonates with the department store, with the coming to Ohio, with coming from Europe, with the universe. Really important that you've left so much for the future and the future part of it lies in this, you know, establishment here so that the students can gather from all of the other facilities, and that's what it's about. It's just wonderful. Well, I, I, I am a great believer that you live on in the people whose lives you impact. And that's what life's all about. Uh, it's not what you make or you get. You do that to take care of your family. But it's what you can give. and, and Sometimes you never even know about these things. I'll tell you one quick story that just comes to mind about that. We had a lady, a lady, I think her name was Anna Brown, I'm not positive. I forget names these days, uh, which is excusable when you're in your 80s. But she came to me when she was the head of aging for the city of Cleveland. And she came to me one day uh, and she said, I want to tell you a story. She said, my family grew up in Rawley, New Jersey. And the Greases there had a clothing store in the town. And when my grandfather was the first African-American 
to ever go to college from that time, they called him in one day and they said, you can't go to college unless you have a decent suit of clothes. You know, your Sunday go to meeting suit, <laughs> as they used to call it. And they gave him a suit. And he went on to college. You never know. And here, this lady is telling me something, I don't know, 60, 70 years later, yeah. that impacted her family, that relatives of mine in New Jersey, who I didn't even know, right. you know, did. And that's what's important in life, it is. It is. is knowing that you've done something and they don't have to know it, but knowing that you've done something that has changed the lives of people. Okay.